direct from Foxborough, Massachusetts, the gem of Norfolk County, and taped at the studios of Foxborough Cable Access. It's Foxborough Central, and here's your host, Bob Hickey. That's a big light, huh? Is that a light? Or just a... Ah, uh, welcome to a great episode of Foxborough Central. I am so glad you took a little time to join us as we learn about the people, events, and organizations that make Foxborough truly the gem of Norfolk County. I am joined here today by many, many knowledgeable town officials. First off, on my left is Mr. Bill Casper. He is our town inspection, building commission. What do you do? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Jim DeVellis uh, is morning, uh, uh, past chairman and current member of our board of selectmen, and Bill Yukna, who is our uh, school finance business manager and also chairman of our municipal building committee. Great. And folks may wonder why I'm having this crew here. Not only are they handsome, but uh, it's important that we, in preparation for the upcoming special town meeting, which is on November 4th. Yeah, correct. correct. All right, I am correct on that. November 4th, we have a special town meeting, and on the warrant is an article to fund, I believe it's $550,000 for architectural design work uh, to uh, create a master plan for a new town hall. And so voters, hopefully voters, want to be informed, and that's uh, what we here at Cable Access are happy to do, is bring information to you. So a little bit of background, uh, and you can jump in whenever, but Town Hall, we know it's an issue. 40 South Street building was built in 1953. 63. 63. So it's uh, 50 years old this year, and it's not aging well. Uh, there have been some maintenance issues over the years, uh, you know, and part of Part of that issue, and I'll just jump in as a former selector myself, uh, with Proposition Two and a Half, it's such an unintended consequence that towns and municipalities are no longer rewarded for maintaining because you can't uh, increase your budget above and beyond two and a half percent to maintain a building, but you certainly can do it uh, for capital expenditures. So that might have been an unintended consequence, benefit, not benefit, of uh, the two and a half movement. But that is the reality, and so all municipalities across Massachusetts face the same sort of dilemma in times of, uh, of, of millennia years where, and I remember back in 2002, 2003, we had to slash certain budgets in order to keep up core services with that issue. So um, I don't think the issue of maintenance, and I think that's a red herring out there, is, is uh, going to be something that is, is important today because I think we all know the realities of municipal budgets and how uh, things go, and I, you can correct me if you're wrong. You're the one who has lived there and, and deal with that every day. Your office is in the building. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so, yeah. did anything I just say was that wrong, or am I pretty pretty much there? No, you were pretty much there. I th I think it would help the public to know a little bit, a little bit more background on that. Back in 1997, there was a space needs committee, which you probably remember, mm -hmm. and at that time, a committee was charged with looking at. Uh, finding a place for the police station, which was located in the basement of uh, Town Hall. Uh, that went through, that was a couple years of uh, due diligence, and at that time it was, the, it was determined that, yes, we need a, a separate location for police, and uh, it didn't address right out, out of the gate, it did not address the uh, fire department. Uh, but it did address doing some renovations for the existing town hall building. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the final outcome out of, out of the space needs was that the police and fire should be combined into a public safety building, and that was put to the forefront uh, at that point. And then town hall was kind of put on the back burner for a later date. So, Well, we in town always have to, as any manager does, you have to prioritize and what is your immediate burning need and I, I think at the time we had and the fire came into that because of the condition of the then uh, fire station uh, was a 1933 structure it, it wasn't compliant it had many issues itself uh, and so the public safety building which is now up on Chestnut um, seems to have worked out and been a good and you're on the municipal building committee at the time right so uh, I, I, I remember working with you and as, as we worked to get all of our ducks in a row there to uh, push the uh, proposal and the funding and the architectural review and then getting the various groups to sign off and join in. And it was, uh, it was an experience and it was a uh, process. 
And it was, and I, and I think one of the outcomes of that, not only, I, I hope, uh, a building that the town's proud of, but also one that showed that just space requirements had increased dramatically for both uh, departments, and, and that's why that building is, quite honestly, more than double the size of what they they both came out of. Mm -hmm. um, but it was because their needs and the requirements of the community had grown that much uh, over the years since the original buildings were put in place. And part of that also is planning for future growth and, and future needs, not just planning for today, but planning for tomorrow, which I suppose brings us up to Town Hall. Sure. We have an existing building that houses, and I'm not going to say comfortably, but houses our uh, core services, but there is some change of foot. I remember when I first mm -hmm. became select and one of the first uh, meetings, if you will, that I had was uh, then Town Clerk Marie Crimmins. Uh, pulled me into her office and said, Bob, I want you to see the number one issue we have here. And she sat me down and she said, that's our safe. This is my space. I don't have enough space and I can't move that. We need to do something. Yeah. That was 2002. It's now 2013. Yeah. Well, and when I came on to Selectman, that was one of the, one of the first items. And, and it's come and it's gone and it's come and it's gone. And it's, I mean, it's not, a very, it's not a project where people have a lot of passion outside of town hall and probably the people that use it where some of the other projects, you know, the police and fire, the schools, the, the turf field, there's people that get together and get excited mm -hmm. about it. So in all honesty, the selectmen, including your error and, and mine, we say we support it, but there hasn't been a lot of passion. And when another project comes, this one goes. And, and I think it's at the point now where it's just got to get done. I mean, people are you know, we can't even have our meetings in there anymore. We're, we're moved out. You're up People at the media moving. center at yeah. the high school now, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, we can we can blame the the past selectmen or the plat, you know, the recent town manager, the past town manager, the lack of maintenance. But um, it, it's a project right now that needs to get done, and I think that's why we're sitting here mm -hmm. saying now is the time to do it. If not, um, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's only going to get worse and it's going to get more expensive. So we're at a tipping point, and we do mm -hmm. need to do something and. Uh, you know, there's, there's also, uh, you know, the, the reality of any time you're asking for an override that is perceived as being an extravagant expense by some as others, it's a cost of doing business. So mm -hmm. how do you make that uh, discussion start and then how do you put the exclamation point onto why this proposal, and I suppose we can talk about what this proposal is because there's many ideas and thoughts out there including some put out by some grumpy columnist, I can't remember his name. Hi there. Uh, but educate me and tell me why this proposal, what this proposal is, and what is the scope of this? Well, I think if you go back to the, the design of it, um, you know, the, the town a few years ago actually hired uh, a professional group in KBA, an architectural firm, which we've used a number of times. Castle Booze. Castle Booze and Associates. Um, We've used them a number of times. They did do the joint public safety building for us. They did the high school for us as well. We have a good working relationship and I think a solid understanding of, of their skill set and what they're capable of doing. Um, we hired them to come in and basically do an evaluation. And it was, uh, while it was an expensive proposition at about a little over $50,000, there was a lot of pieces to that, that project. The first one was the space needs. Uh, and again, when you typically do that, you're looking at every single department and not looking at what they have but what do they really need to be efficient and, and, and um, able to do their jobs appropriately for the taxpayers? Um, and then also, to your point originally, you know, having a little bit of an expansion capability within a building. Uh, the building committee has never come forward with a project that was built uh, day one to its capacity. Uh, we don't think that's wise for any uh, taxpayer's money. Um, so even in this project, there's a, there's a little bit of room for you know, a person here or a person there, the space for them to, to exist in the future. Big issue is, is storage. Even though we talk about being into a um, paperless society, the, the reality is the state requires us to keep uh, paper. We are government. Uh, that's right. And, and so we keep that for years. If you're in the town's clerk's office, you keep it forever. If you're in some of our other departments, it's seven years. Um, and it and accumulates a lot of, of paperwork that needs to be you know, appropriately stored. And, and I'd hate to show you how some of it is today. Um, <laughs> and you know, we have lost some because of, of the issues within sure. the building uh, over time, which is I not mean, obviously optimal. I, I think anybody in town who is involved and has been around it has a story or two. I, when I found uh, once we were moving the nativity scene out of the Quaker Hill School and all of the planning department's uh, papers were down there because they were moved into the Taylor School, and that's where they're housed, and they couldn't put all their equipment, and there was water damage, and, and it was, so this town has always had 
a need to store stuff and always had an issue of where to appropriate do that. So that's a point I don't think anybody's made yet, but it's key to this discussion. And it absolutely, and it is part of the square footage that we, we talk about when we talk about the new building at, at a little over 17,000 square feet. Um, the other thing that there's, you know, as you know, the ad hoc committee who has come up uh, with opposition to the, the, our plan. Um, and when I say our plan, it really is, you know, not just the building committees. It's really a, a group of professionals that put that together, which we worked with, and, and actually the people within the, the town hall, the department heads who uh, have a vested interest in, in how this thing will lay out over time, all worked with to pull together. And one of our things is, is really in our design is to keep things where you have good circulation. Um, in any good efficient office building, it's not a matter of having consolidated space so that everything is so tight um, that people can't have confidential conversations, um, taxpayer to a, an assessor, taxpayer to a town clerk we don't type have that of thing. <laughs> no, we don't. Um, so having, having a, a good flow um, in, in the building itself I think is extremely important. Uh, having good working spaces, whether it's, uh, we talk about sightline a lot of, uh, in our conversations, and that is that we do, you know, we don't have large staff, we're not anticipating uh, growing staff just like the library and their things, so building so that when you do have a customer come to the counter, wherever the counter is, everybody in that department can see it is very important. So meaning even somebody in the office space could see the, the sightline. Um, and again, that takes a lot of planning and a lot of uh, you know, maneuvering so that if their staff is at lunch, somebody sitting in an office still knows that you came to the counter and can go, go help you with it. Because a key um, piece of town government is customer service. It, it's probably the largest yes. you know, when you look at it. Um, and I think the other side of it is from our point that one of the biggest issues we ran into, one of the reasons we really pushed for the uh, you know, new building versus the renovation, is really the condition of that lower level uh, that we have to work in. Um, it is in the ground. Drainage can be resolved uh, with a, you know, you can resolve almost anything if you're willing to throw money at it. Um, but the, the real problem that we have there is the head heights. And we really believe that when you do most of the mechanical work that you need to do, um, there are a number of ways to do mechanicals in tight spaces. Uh, and I'll give you a perfect example. At the Boyden Library, all of our um, lower level, which has got a tight ceiling space, all of our air conditioning stuff is underground. Now, it's very expensive to do, but it was the only option we had if we wanted to keep our head heights. Um, so you can do a lot of these things, but they raise the cost in, in any project when you go through it. And to be honest with you, I would not want to put ductwork under the ground uh, in that uh, particular location because of the water issues we mm -hmm. have there. Um, so I think the, you know, the, the ability to have a very usable um, 6,000 square feet on the lower level uh, is key to us and not putting a lot of money towards something we don't think in the end you'll end up with primary you know good space for um, so I think when you look at our space uh, in our layouts um, and I we've alluded to it before but when you look at the circulations that you'll have in these plans it's very good for the customer side of it coming in being able to go to the, the department that they're working with um, be able to have those conversations that are, are important um, and, and have a good flow to it overall. Um, so I think, you know, that's one of our, our prime concerns is really having a very usable building when we're done. And one that, again, we've always touted every project as a 25 year project, meaning not just that it lasts 25, because well, I was 25 is my 50s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, it, but if but you when think I say about that, it, a 25 year project is, is what we typically promote these things as. Sure. But that's the current correct. town hall has been there for 50 years. So for people who say, well, that building, we, we didn't maintain it, we didn't get full use of it. That's not necessarily the case. It's a perception, but the reality is, I remember we were doing the public safety building and working through that. I wanted a sandy roof, some people wanted a flat roof, but it was because, well, over 30 years, this is what the projection is. And I said, I remember this, I said, yeah, but I'm thinking more than 30 years because I'm still going to be alive and paying taxes here Absolutely. over 30 years. And so everybody kind of gave me the wink and says, okay, we're really talking more in 30 years, but we're we talking, have to realistically talk about a timeline. Yeah, so. we're talking 25 years. When we talk about that, we're not talking about the life of the building. We really believe these buildings should be much greater. Mm -hmm. Actually, to have a building at 50 years that, that you really don't have the confidence in going forward with, there's only been two buildings in town like that, uh, where the current Sage School is, which was one of the uh, least expensive buildings built in the town in its construction, and, and the town hall are the only two that we've run into as a building committee um, other than the, uh, I guess I should say the fire department too, but that's just because of its location right. and tightness. But, so, but our other buildings, you know, are, are very well built. They're very solid. There would be no reason to ever, you know, take down a high school when you have such a nice structure as what we had. You know, and, and, and the Sage School is a great example where the Municipal Building Committee 
uh, does have not only the expertise, but also a realistic view. And, and the decision was made back in 2003 that that was not going to be an asset that we could build upon. Uh, and we made the determination that it'd be better to sell it, not burden it. Because I think the cost, and you were the one who, you didn't fall through the roof, but you, had, you did fall through the roof. No, no, I didn't fall through it, but uh, yeah. it, it got you, ugly one, you, you one snowy day. You called me up on my yes. way home from work, and yeah. I stopped by to see you, and there's water cascading Yeah, into Michael Leary and I... Yes. Uh, we're shoveling off the roof because yes. it's, there was a heavy snow load. And the key to that is, is not that you go above and beyond the call of duty every day and for years and years and years for this good town, but that the Municipal Building Committee has a realistic view of what is an asset, what is not an asset. And so it's not a slash and burn approach to everything. No, it's right. a, okay, we can build upon this. The Ahern is a beautiful project. I know you're front and center on that, uh, that you know, clearly uh, that building is ready to go for the next oh. era. Right. Uh, but Town Hall, you're saying, is not. And there's the other issue of, you talk about height in the basement. The basement wasn't uh, meeting the needs of office space and cell space and everything else that the police department needed. And now it's not meeting the needs for anybody. The entire group has been displaced. I think you had the planning board down there, and they've now mm -hmm. been displaced, and they're up in your meeting space. The, and that's in the process of moving up. Yeah. So the Town Hall is not usable right now anyway. Right. So that's why we're really at a tipping point as opposed to before it was just a really urgent need, now it's a must need. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a little bit about the scope, but is there more than one plan or is it just one plan that we're proposing? There were actually multiple, multiple plans. I mean, it, it, we've gotten it down to what has been con being considered two by the KBA side and one by the ad hoc side, but originally um, KBA actually had designed probably um, five or six different designs. One of them, ironically, was very similar to what the ad hoc committee has come up really? with. Um, but again, because of flow and you know space requirements and, and the entire thing of coming up to the current code compliance uh, side of things, the building was growing. And we just felt that we couldn't push everything in there and then sell it to the taxpayers as this is a long-term solution. Um, and I think that was really kind of critical on our side that this is has to be a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the code compliance issues within this building obviously are, are critical and, and, you know, no one can speak to that more than Bill, but, you know, when you look at our older buildings and every one that we've renovated, we've had to deal with this. So whether it's, uh, you know, for ADA, meaning elevators and uh, walkways that, that get people into it, or is it fire protection within the building that we don't have in most of our older buildings? Um, you know, there's just so many things. The, the, the simple thing like bathrooms, we have a men's stall and a woman's stall. Um, that doesn't even come close to being code compliant nowadays. Really? Yeah. So if there was a renovation, the American Disabilities Act, of course, is what Bill's uh, referring to. Because of the project scope, we'd have to be in compliance with new construction, essentially. Well, it wouldn't matter if it's the re uh, we went with a renovation or new. You'd have to comply either mm -hmm. way. Uh, but yes, you'd have to comply with uh, the American Disability Act, elevators, accessibility, it, that, that includes even the fire alarm and, and the, the devices on the walls, uh, audible and visual type. So, and it would have to be a sprinkler building, which it is not now. Uh, these all add costs as well. Plus we have the uh, lingering uh, lead issue from the former shooting range and the fact that the attic and uh, space needs to be completely gutted out and that's, so that's there's a lot of things that go into this that may not make for a good conversation at town meeting but are very much players in this whole game absolutely so we talked about some scope and size issues so there's one proposal on the table that the municipal building committee is putting forward well we we actually made our recommendation to the selectmen um, with the two proposals one, we have a selectman here yeah. yes that's that's why we have a selectman there because there are <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we actually what we presented to them was both the uh, renovation addition and the new construction um, and and prior to that meeting even though we were, we were proposing both we basically had advised them that the building committee at that point was recommending new construction and we gave our reasons obviously with you know, um, the usable space within the building and what we consider the long-term uh, benefits of having the new building over the cost of, of doing it. So you made a strong recommendation, brought it to the selectmen, selectmen voted and? Yeah, we, we actually voted a few times on it in, um, in, in the big picture from a selectman's perspective, it's, it's our warrant article, but we don't have the expertise to study it. And uh, so one of the first questions that we asked or we looked at was the permanent building committee. 
and the expertise or the history that they've had. And if you look at um, the Ahern, the IGO, the library, the public safety building, um, the high school, uh, we, have, we had a confidence level that, you know, that that group plus the experts that say hire. So, so KBA, even though they're architects, they hire uh, mechanical engineers, plumbing engineers, electrical engineers, geotechnical, um, landscape architects, civil engineers. So they came back to us with either option A or option B. One is completely you know, knock down and, and build new. The other one is renovate and do an addition for the space needs. Uh, so, you know, cost-wise, they're a little different, but they were pretty similar. Square footage different a little bit. So we had a number of meetings, and, and I actually sat with the ad hoc and went to one of the gentlemen's living room, showed me his plans. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a long process. So we voted uh, all things equal to knock it down based on the professional recommendations that we were getting. So um, all things equal. Let's yeah. talk a little cost here. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, all things equal? Um, there's, a, there's a cost to knock it down and build new. Okay, and there's a cost to renovate it. Now, building new, you know what the costs are going to be relative. Um, maybe not a little bit of the geotech because you're not underground yet, but you know industry standards what they're going to be. When you go to a renovation and you start looking at, you know, bringing up elevators, cutting the the floor, going up, going down into the basement with a, another story of an elevator, uh, looking at what the outside of the building is. You know, you get brick courses coming down. You don't know if you have to take all of that down or if you can just point them. So those costs, there's a lot of unknown costs mm -hmm. to those. And, and base, basically listening to the architect, listening to the building committee. And, and we all have experiences um, in that, tra uh, either with our home or, you know, I'm a civil engineer, I do that for municipal projects all the time. I think we were confident that new is better for the existing costs that are on the table, plus the unknown costs that you know you don't have once you start getting into it. Okay. So. so, and I think you're alluding to if you start to renovate, there's always something that happens. I'm just yeah. cleaning out my garage and I broke a window, so that's an unknown cost, but that's not a reality. I have to fix my window. Much bigger skill, of course, with uh, renovating a basement that is 50 years old and not compliant. With, yeah, with and, the then, and then when you're adding to that, and, and as Bill alludes, the handicapped accessible codes, the seismic codes, when you're taking something new, because it's not just renovating, it's renovation with an expansion. That's I don't think there's any plan that says just renovation. Out, the, the renovation was to come out the front towards yeah. the parking. Yeah, yeah, because size-wise, whether it's code or each person per code needs a certain square footage. So if you go into the clerk's office, they're all sitting around a, a small area. Yes. You can't build a building like that anymore. So As my friend so, Marie pointed out to me yeah. many so, years ago. <laughs> so just the fact that you, you need to come up to code means the same amount of people get bigger anyways. So when you're taking new and then tying it into existing structural and seismic, it, it's, yeah, well, let me give you a, someone had asked me the other day if they can come in and take some pictures in, in a video to show the people how bad it is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that's possible because you go in there, you know, you look at the bricks in the, in the cupola and the, it looks New England, it looks beautiful. You go inside, you know, it's clean, it's people are working there. You can't show very effectively what's wrong with it because I it's remember, mostly code. I remember uh, that being done when we were working uh, and Chief O'Leary, Chief Ed O'Leary uh, was uh, pushing and pushing and pushing for the safety of his, his uh, crew but also just for the reality of what the building looked like. He was showing the, the uh, wiring necessary, uh, the IT piece of it and, and just all the exposed wiring and the heat being generated but you mm. can't videotape heat. And that was a huge piece of what the problems at Town Hall were, was that the heat being generated from the uh, computer room, if you will, uh, what do you call them, the mechanical room, mm -hmm. uh, was, was you know, essentially frying the system. Yeah. And you can't videotape that. Sure. So you're right, videotape yeah. only goes so far. A lot of it is the, is the story. And that's why we're here today. I'm here with Bill Casper, Jim DeVellis, and Bill Yukna, who uh, are collectively proposing uh, that we vote affirmatively on the warrant article t uh, coming up at special town meeting on November 4th to appropriate $550,000 for architectural plans to uh, take the first step towards, well, maybe the second step, if we've already had the space needs review, uh, we're now in the second mm -hmm. step to create the building so that we can go forward with a future funding proposal. Why not all now? 
Well, one of the one of the things that the building committee and it's and you know Staying we looked on at the this. theme of cost. Yeah, we looked at this. You know, we looked at this from a couple of approaches, and, and again, I think Jim alluded to the fact that something like the town hall is not at, does not have as a big a constituents that is going to push for it. So rather than go in with a very big unknown, um, we felt that it was much better if we could walk in with a, f a fixed cost. Mm -hmm. And here is where we are, you know, plus or minus for a contingency side of things, which you always have to have. Um, and by doing this approach, what we will actually have done is design the final plans, design the final specs, gone out to bid, and actually have a contractor give us a price as to what they're going to, willing to build it for. Um, and so at that point, you're walking back into the town meeting and saying, this is how much we need, and here's our contract that says they can do it for that amount. That's, a, mm -hmm. that's an interesting approach, and some people are saying, well, we need no whole cost, but I like that because one of the criticisms of the uh, high school project, if you'll allow me to go down that path, was that we appropriated, and I, again, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a TV host and a columnist, so of course nobody expects me to actually have details, but mm -hmm. About $20 the, million. it was $21 million for the high school renovation, all told that we voted to allow the bonding of, correct? And then that project came in significantly under that. Mm -hmm. So it was a, and, and a lot of it's been given back and there was reimbursement, and there are reasons for that, mm -hmm. but some of those reasons aren't here. There's no state reimbursement program for town halls, correct. whereas there was a state reimbursement program for school renovation. Yeah. And there's no uh, compelling reason to over authorize. It would be easy to come in with a bonding request, I would imagine, for $11 million and then be over and have extra money. But one of the criticisms was that people wanted to take extra bonded money and give it back. So this is sort of responding to that and saying, all right, very good. We're going to come back with specifics. We specifically want $550,000 now to create the plans. And then we're going to specifically come back with the actual true cost post bid of what it's going to cost. And, and you bring so it's a more realistic way of doing business. It's different, right. but it's, there's, some, there's some compelling reasons to do it this well, way. Well, I, I think it shows that the town is capable of being flexible in the way we approach things. But I think the other side, uh, you know, major differences like in our cost side of this, you know, we have as a building committee always come to town with what we consider to be the taxpayer's worst case. We don't ever want to walk into a town meeting and say we need X and then have to walk back into another town meeting and say by, mis by our mistake, you voted for it, we're already in the process. Nobody likes to come that. back. Um, so I think our approach is that we'll, we're going to uh, supply conservative numbers. And, and I'm going to give you an example of the difference between the ad hoc's uh, recommendation and our recommendation. Within the cost of our side of the $8.6 million, we're sitting on nearly a million dollars in contingency cost. About half of that is in the design contingency Again, we're not finished, we have schematics, but mm -hmm. we haven't really worked out all the final details. And the other half of that is actually in construction contingency. Um, and again, you know, you run into different problems within a site, as, as Jim said, hopefully we'd have a lot less uh, in new construction than we would have in a renovation. But in, the, in this part of the game, we typically would carry, and we have on every project that we've gone to town meeting with, uh, a 10% contingency on construction side. And then on this one, we're carrying currently 10% on design. Okay. Again, those will all either become a, a, a non-number by the time we get to town meeting or a very small number because all we'll need is for the unknown potentially within the geotechnical uh, side of this, the plans. On the ad hoc side, they're carrying $200,000 with rough plans with no real uh, knowledge of what the renovation is going to be. Gotcha. It's not realistic. So it's not an apples to oranges. It, it absolutely isn't. Absolutely so you can take, and, and you know, when you actually look at, um, below the construction cost, the, the what they're calling the um, GC's markup, which we would typically call the actual general conditions and requests, requirements. They're carrying about 500,000, we're carrying about 1.5. So there's a million dollar difference just on that line. And again, there are things in there, bond cost, interest, insurance, uh, those don't go away. You know, They're not gonna get mitigated, they are what they are, and the general contractor is gonna charge it. When you look at the, the second big component, that owner's cost, we're carrying uh, about 2.1 million, they're carrying about 1.4. Well, again, in that area, they're, they're trying to say that architects will work for a fee that we don't believe, based on our experience, that they'll work for. Uh, other, other costs, again, and contingencies and things have been chopped way down and, and chopped out. My, my concern here is, are we telling the taxpayers the truth of where we probably will end up? And I would rather see, I'd rather walk into town meeting and say, oh, by the way, it's going to be an $8 million project, not an 8.6 then walk in and say it's going to be a 5.6. Oh no, it's really going to be a 6.6, 7.6. Um, I don't think that's realistic. You're asking taxpayers to put money up 
Um, and I think there's a risk, a much bigger risk going that route than, uh, and again, I think contingencies are, are the way the world works. Um, and, and walking in with very, very low ones, I think is a very you know, big hazard to the, the taxpayer. It's a strong message. We have zero time left, and I'm gonna say thank you. You're gonna get the last word, and you three can decide who wants the last word. But while you're thinking of that, I'm gonna thank, uh, mm -hmm. uh, particularly our, our two volunteer members here. Uh, uh, Bill Yukna, of course, uh, is, has been a longtime volunteer and leader of our uh, permanent municipal building committee, and Jim DeVellis, long-term selectman and, mm -hmm. and long-time advisory committee and, and a volunteer. So very knowledgeable, and of course, Bill Kasbara, who has been our uh, super town inspections, enforcement officer, building commissioner, all, all around For what? Uh, kayak bringer For upper what? from the basement, <laughs> uh, every, everything that's necessary to push these things along. You've been front and center and a leader on that. So thank you for taking a little time to come share with us at Foxborough Central. You want the last word, Bill? I'll actually let Jim have it. Jim. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, big, big picture. Are we going to um, nosies or? No, no. Uh, it, it's not a very popular project because there's not a lot of people that say, if I give this tax money to it, I'm going to see a direct benefit because a lot of people don't even go into town hall. Uh, it, it's been a process. You know, over the last couple of months, and, and you included, you know, you read the articles about the Taj Mahal and you read the ad hoc, um, you know, editorials and stuff. We've kind of sat back, and, and it's one of those things where we just say it, it's not quite true, but nobody's jumping forward to uh, dispel those myths or rumors. Um, it's a project that I think it's in keeping with industry standard for municipal. Um, construction. If you look at the other projects around the immediate area, and, and I know there was one brought up, um, Bridgewater, um, we're, we're more cost effective than some of those ones that are touted as being, you know, this project is grandiose or decadent. It, it's not that. If you look at the floor plan, it, it's very simple. Um, it provides the, the code compliance that you just need to do. It, it's not a, a, you know, you can't pick and choose. You just need to do it. It's not a building where um, people are going to chain themselves to because it's architecturally beautiful and it's you know it looks nice but there's nothing significant that would let you spend the extra money to save it you know it's not historic uh, so at the end of the day we're at the point where we either do it on, on a plan that has been vetted with our municipal building committee and, and brought around for the people that understand it um, they, they're buying into it if we don't do it you know I don't see a, a, I don't see your group supporting the renovation just because it doesn't make sense on a, on a lot of levels and we're going to go back to the quagmire that has been there for I don't know 10 12 years and another project may push it aside but at this point where people have left the basement we need to do something mm -hmm. and this is I think the best plan that's on the table uh, with the caveat that it's easy to kick and easy to make fun of but if you spend the time and look at it and, and go through the numbers and see what's there now uh, you're hard-pressed not to support it so. Information is power, and mm -hmm. that is a lot of good information. Hopefully folks will come out to the special town meeting uh, with an informed uh, mindset and uh, vote uh, to make a decision on November 4th. And I want to thank you, gentlemen, for taking the time to come mm -hmm. give that information to the folks of Foxborough. On behalf of all the volunteers at Cable Access, I have zero time. I am so over. I'm not even going to tell you to go to fcatv.org to go check us out. I'm not going to tell you to come volunteer or call us at 508-543-4757 to find out more about how you can become a part of the Cable Access mission. I'm not going to tell you any of that. I'm just going to say have a great day, Foxborough.